We are glad that we could be here today as we congregate another time in the house of the Lord. And we are going to continue our uh, verse by verse study of the book of Matthew. We find ourselves in Matthew chapter 26 today. We bow heads in prayer. Gracious Father, we love you and we praise you. God, you are ever faithful and compassionate towards us. We are your children. We are the sheep of your pastor, Lord. You love us with an everlasting love. And God, even when we are discouraged, when we are broken, I pray, O oh God, for your divine intervention in our lives as we congregate today. Father, we pray that your spirit will be poured out upon us in a fresh way. You refresh us, revive us, stir up our hearts, O oh God, embrace us in your arms of love. And even as we open up the text, of scripture today, Lord. We pray that the word of God will become clear to us, dear Father. Divine revelation will come. I pray for special impartation in the hearts of your people. Heal our bodies, our soul, our mind, and our spirit as we look into the text of scripture today. We ask these favors in the precious name of your son, Yeshua. So we are in Matthew chapter 26. Now as we look of where we are in the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 26. Uh, Matthew have 28 chapters, so we, we, we have another three chapters that we are going to deal with as we enter chapter 26. And um, These three following chapters are very important because they dealt with the arrest of Yeshua the Messiah. They dealt with all the different trials because Yeshua had different trials that he uh, went through and it's going to deal with the different trials that he had and it's going to deal with his crucifixion it's going to deal with his death his burial and his resurrection so the, these chapters are very important where our uh, our belief is concerned where us as God-fearing people the God-fearing commu community these chapters are very important because our faith is literally based on the events that is going to take place in these uh, three following chapters as we get into it. It said in verse 1 of Matthew chapter 26, And it came to pass when Yeshua had finished all these sayings, he said to his disciples. Now when, when the text here talks about all of the sayings that Yeshua just accomplished, I think we have to go back to maybe Matthew chapter 22 and we saw where he started talking to the scribe and the Pharisees and all of the elders and leaders of the temple. We saw where he called them whitewashed uh, sepulchers, he called them hypocrites and all of that. And then we go into the text where he told them that their house is going to become desolate. He spoke about the destruction of Jerusalem, the destruction of the temple. You know, um, the disciples asked him, you know, when, you know, what is going to be the sign of his coming uh, and the end of the world. And we go into all of that in uh, chapter 24, and we go into the, the, the marriage feast with the, 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 the ten virgins. The scripture says five was wise, five was foolish. So when the text said, talk about all of the sayings of Yeshua, he's making reference to uh, these things that I just mentioned. And it said, and it came to pass when Yeshua had finished these sayings. So um, what is happening here, this is bringing uh, a close to the uh, ministry, the, 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 the um, uh, public ministry of Yeshua is more or less come to an end uh, as we start this chapter because from now on he's not going to preach and teach uh, the public you know any kind of a, a teaching or any kind of a instruction that he's going to give it's going to be to his disciples so it's like his public ministry come to an end he said to his disciples so from here on he starts speaking to his disciples and we know disciples are talking about people who are trained they are followers it's people who want to learn people that those who wants to learn from him and we have to understand that we have to be his disciples because 
we have to learn from Yeshua the Messiah just like the disciples in his early ministry was learning from him. He said, ye know that after two days is the feast of the Passover and the Son of Man is betrayed to be crucified. Now we notice here that Yeshua is saying, ye know that after two days. So I, I love what he's saying here. He is saying to the disciples, ye know. It's not just Yeshua knew that the, the Passover feast was ahead. But the disciples, he wants them to keep that in their memory. And he's letting them know, you also know. And you know, as I look at the text and he's talking about the disciples know uh, about the Passover coming up. You know, it's important that we know certain things for ourselves. We can depend on people to know everything for us. If, if we don't know certain things, you know, we are going to be taken uh, advantage of. And, you know, um, when you don't know things, people tend to mislead you. They, they tend to want to uh, take advantage, to lead you astray. And we as God-fearing people, we have to know certain things for ourselves. And I think there's a text that tells us that God's people is being destroyed because of the lack of knowledge. And even when you don't know something and you receive instruction from somebody else, before you swallow those uh, instructions, you have to check it out. You have to analyze it and make sure that it, it is um, true and it is something that you can follow. So he it, it is saying here, you know that after two days is the feast of the Passover. So when he talks here about the feast of the Passover, the Passover feast that Yeshua is making a reference to here, it goes back into the Old Testament in the book of uh, Exodus, when the when when the Israelite, the Hebrew Israelite people, the original Hebrew Israelite people, this is talking about when they received their deliverance from uh, Egyptian captivity. Remember, you know, the, the Lord told them uh, that they were supposed to get a lamb and slaughter it and cover the doorposts of their uh, homes with the, the blood of the, the, the lamb. And during the night, the dead angels were supposed to pass over the land of Egypt, according to Exodus. And all of the homes that did not have that blood uh, smeared over their doorposts, the dead angel killed or, or you know, uh, uh, slay uh, the firstborn of all of those families. And all, none of the uh, Hebrew Israelite people uh, was touched by the dead angel. And it is during that night uh, God uh, delivered the um, Hebrew Israelite people, the original Hebrew Israelite people from out of Egyptian captivity. So when you talk here about the feast, or the, 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 fest, the festival that was two days away. What they used to do from, from that time that the Israelites received their deliverance from Egypt, they began to commemorate, they began to celebrate that time. When that time of the year uh, comes around, I think it's the 14th of Nisan, it comes around, they start celebrating uh, their deliverance. And I think the, the feast used to go on for seven days. So there's a lot that we can see in, in, in this uh, text here. He said, you know that after two days is the feast of the Passover. So the Passover feast is coming up in two days. And the Son of Man is betrayed to be crucified. Now, some Bible interpreters are saying that this day, as we look at what the text is saying here, this is... Uh, the Wednesday. Some people say, well, this is the, the Wednesday. And uh, Yeshua is saying that he had two days uh, before his crucifixion. Some people are saying this is talking about the Tuesday. And when Yeshua is saying he had two days before his crucifixion, some interpreters believe that Yeshua was crucified on a Thursday. Now, those that believe that this is Wednesday, uh, what they're saying is that two days, in two days time, he's going to be crucified. So he is crucified on a Friday. But, you know, none, I don't think anybody really know the exact day that Yeshua was crucified. They, they're not sure. They don't even know the exact year. You know, um, honest Bible interpreters will tell you they don't know the exact 
year when Yeshua was crucified. They don't know the exact day when Yeshua was crucified. All I think what is really important is that he was crucified. I know, you know, in Christianity, they make a whole doctrine out of it and they say, well, he was crucified on a Friday. So, you know, they're talking about, you know, Good Friday and how holy that Friday is. But in, in, in reality, nobody really know the day, no, the year when he was crucified. And it's the same thing where the birth of Yeshua is concerned. They don't know the exact year when Yeshua was born. Honest in talk because of the Bible will tell you. They, they can't really pinpoint uh, the exact year when he was born. They, they can't pinpoint the exact um, day that he was born. I know in, in Christian circles, you know, we tend to believe that it's December 23rd, uh, 25, sorry, uh, that he was born. And that is not true. You know, so these are things that we can't really build any doctrine on because we don't know exactly you know, the, the, the precise time when uh, these things really happen. And even though I make that those statements and say that we don't know the exact day that he, he died, but because of what Yeshua told us, he said that he's going to spend three days and three nights in the belly of the, uh, of the earth, in the heart of the earth. And it made no sense to say that Yeshua probably died on a Thursday than to say he died on a Friday. Because if he died on a Thursday, and we have to put what he said concerning spending three days in the belly of the earth, we, we, can, we can more fit the, uh, that together, fit the Thursday, um, three days in the heart of the earth, together than if we have from Friday. It, it is hard to fit from Friday to what? Sunday morning and get that three days out of it. If you have it from Thursday, I think it, it's quite easy to see how you can get three days from, from out of, you know, saying that Yeshua was crucified on, on a Thursday. You know, but because I know there's a lot of uh, interpreters of the Bible who uh, believe that it was a, a, a Thursday that the crucifixion took place and there's a lot of interpreters who believe it was a Friday but you know we're not going to make any argument over that I'm just trying to uh, give you something to, to think about now what he says is that his crucifixion his betrayal his crucifixion is going to take place in two days time now his betrayal came before the crucifixion so um, what, what all of this is talking about uh, what is going to be done to him and uh, no name, the, the, the betrayer is not mentioned here. But we know because of, we, we read ahead that he's talking about what Judas is going to do. Judas is going to turn him over into the hand of the enemy. And when I look at these verse, when I look at the, you know, what is being said and what is mentioned in this verse and he's talking about betraying and he's talking about crucifying and I know sometimes we don't like to deal with the hard question but when we say Jesus is God can we can we betray God can you betray God can you turn God can a person turn God into the hand of an enemy we know Jesus was turned in over into the hands of the enemy you think God ancient of days the father you can turn him into the, uh, the hand of, uh, of, of the enemy. You think, uh, can we crucify, can we crucify God? Can God be crucified? Can God die? You know, can, can, can you bury God? All of these are hard questions. People say, well, you know, these things happen because Jesus, uh, he came in the form of a man and, you know, God allowed these things to happen. But these are questions that needs to be answered when we, when we say that Jesus was God, just as God the Father is God, these are questions that people have in mind and these are questions that needs to be answered. You know, if he's God, how can he be uh, betrayed? And how can he be crucified? And the text tells us in verse 3, Then assembly together the chief priests and the scribes and the elders of the people to the palace, of the high priest who was called Caiaphas. So uh, what we are seeing here, we are seeing a gathering of the Sanhedrin council. And this is not those uh, little priests from Galilee or from Capernaum that 
Yeshua used to have so much uh, argument with and they trying to trap him and all of this kind of thing. We are talking about those guys in Jerusalem. We are talking about the high priest. We are talking about those who are at the, the highest level. Then assembly together the chief priest. So this is God's man. This is supposed to be God's man. The chief priest, he is the man that is speaking on the behalf of God. He is the man that controls the temple. You know, just like how God used to use Aaron and Phineas and, you know, uh, Abihu and all of those um, priests that come down from Old Testament time. This is the man who is supposed to be hearing from God. And the, the, the scripture said that assembly together, the chief priest. So the chief priest and the scribe, all of the guys who interpret the, 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 the Old Testament text. When you talk about the scribes, these are the men who was interpreting the text and also writing the text. And he talks about the elders of the people. So all of them, they gather together. This is the whole council. And what they're gathering together and here to do is to kill Yeshua the Messiah. And look at what he said in the text. To the palace of the high priest. So the, the, this high priest, he had a palace. And what is happening here, it is just like what we have in, in, in Christianity today. When we have so much of these prosperity preachers that live it up. And who have their private jet and their, their yacht and their different mansions and stuff like that. Here we are seeing in the time of Yeshua, um, the high priest, he was living in a palace. And, you know, it means that this guy, it, what, what, what he did, he turned uh, the office that he was holding, which he, he literally bought the office from the Roman government. And he turned it into a business. And if we read in, in the text of scripture, we will see uh, that the high priest that we're going to talk about here is Caiaphas. And Caiaphas and his father-in-law, Annas, these are the men who are controlling, these are the men who are controlling all of the business that was going on in the temple. All of the animals that was being uh, sold in the temple. When you want to make a sacrifice, you can't carry your own animal because they're going to find a fault with it. And you have to buy an animal from the, the temple. These are the men who used to exchange the mo money. You have to get a, a temple shekel to pay your, your, your whatever, uh, you know, uh, taxes or whatever you have to pay to the temple. You have to pay using the temple sh shekel. And these men were selling all of these things in the temple. And, you know, that's, that's the reason why you could see here that this guy uh, is said to the palace of the high priest who was called Caiaphas. So this guy Caiaphas was rich. He was well to do. And what, what they're doing here, they're, they're, they're going to have the trial of Yeshua in the palace of the high priest, at the home of the high priest, which was illegal. And no trial was supposed to happen at the residence of the high priest. They have accommodation in the temple where they, they usually have trials when the people do, anybody do something that is wrong and they have to pass judgment on them. They have the place in the temple where they will have these things taken care of. But here we see that they are, they are planning a, a meeting uh, on how they can kill Yeshua the Messiah and they are doing it in the, 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 the palace of the high priest, uh, Caiaphas. Now, when we talk about Caiaphas, this Caiaphas, when you read in the book of John chapter 11, he is the same man that came up with a prophecy. This man hated Jesus. But when you read in the book of John chapter 11, you will see when, well, I guess Jesus was performing all of these miracles and he was getting all of this, uh, he was becoming so popular with the people and stuff like that. And uh, the leaders of the temple, they were afraid of what the Romans is going to do to them. And Caiaphas came up with an idea. He said, you know, it is expedient, you know, that one man should die for the nation. One man should die for the people. And he's talking about that one man because Yeshua was having all of these uh, miracles taking place and people was following him. And they were afraid that the, the Romans is going to come in and take away their place, take away their position you know, uh, the authority that they have. So this guy, Caiaphas, he came up with the idea. He said, let us kill Jesus. 
It, it is expedient for us to kill that one man should die for the people and that the whole people, the whole nation suffer not. So, so, so this man here, Caiaphas, he have the idea, he's the man that hatched the plan to kill Yeshua the Messiah. He wanted Yeshua the Messiah dead. And we have to understand that Caiaphas was the high priest. He was over the temple. Amen. So what, what he tells us, and in verse 4, and consulting that they might take Yeshua by subtlety and kill him. So they want to take him by using trickery. They want to take him by using lie. And we have to understand that the enemy, our enemy, the word of God tells us that the, 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 the devil is like a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour. The enemy is not going to play fair with us. The enemy is not going to hesitate if you are down to hit you while you are down. And we, we see how nasty these men are, are here. These men that have all of these titles. They have titles like high priests. They have titles, they are elders, they are scribes, they are teachers of the law. And look at what they are saying here. They want to, they are taking counsel. These men supposed to be the leaders of God's people, and they are taking counsel that uh, 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 and counsel that they might take Yeshua by subtlety. So they they, 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 they want to take him by using trickery. This is what the text is saying here. They want to take him by using trickery. And as I was saying, you know, uh, the enemy don't play fair. And uh, these men, they were being used by the enemy. Yeah, the, these leaders who were supposed to be leaders of the temple, they were allowing the enemy to, to use them. They want to take Yeshua by subtlety, using tricks or using lie to kill him. In verse 5, but they said, not on the feast day, lest there be an uproar among the people. So they want to kill Yeshua. The Messiah, but they don't want to kill him on the feast day. When you talk about the feast day, you're talking about uh, the, 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 that day, that special day, the 14th of Nisan, when the Passover lamb was supposed to be killed. They don't want no killing. They don't want no big commotion to take place during that celebration because there are lots of people in Jerusalem, especially from where Yeshua was from. Yeshua had a lot of supporters. People who were supporting him who was in Jerusalem at the time. So what they say that we don't want to kill him on this day because he had too much of his friends. Too much of his buddies are here in Jerusalem. And if we try to take him by subtlety during that time, during the, the, the day of the feast, then his supporters might look to cause some kind of a, um, a commotion. So they didn't want him to die on the feast day. But we have to understand that even though they didn't want Yeshua to die on the feast day, God the Father want Yeshua to die on that particular day. Because the feast day was the day when all of those lamb, uh, the sacrificial lamb that was slain for the sins of the people, that was the day when the lamb was being slain. On the 14th of Nisan, I guess because of the amount of lambs that they used to sacrifice, because I think according to Josephus, the, uh, the historian who was back in that time, what he said is that they used to sacrifice approximately 250,000 animals used to be sacrificed for the, the Passover because they used to want um, a, a, a family of 10 people. They used to try to get 10 people together so they can have one lamb for 10 families and when they walk it out there's a possibility that maybe they used to have close to 3 million people in Jerusalem when Passover time come around. So what the text is telling us, uh, they want to kill the Yeshua the Messiah but they don't want to kill him on the feast day. And it is just showing us here that the death of Yeshua the Messiah did not happen accidentally. God the Father, he set it up. Yes, God the Father set it up. I think one time Yeshua is saying, one, uh, one power I received from my Father is that he gave me power to lay my life down and he gave me power to take it up again. 
They didn't take his life. It's because of the fact that God planned it. It was planned by Almighty God that Yeshua, the Messiah, who was prepared as the Lamb of God to be sacrificed on that particular day, even though the high priest and all of the leaders of the temple did not want him to die on the feast day. Uh, still, he's, that, that's going to be the, the day that they're going to they're going to sacrifice him or kill him. He said, lest there be an uproar among the people. So they don't want the supporters of Yeshua to cause you know, an, an uproar. So they said, well, we don't want to kill him on the feast day. We want to wait until the whole feast is over. The feast used to last for seven days. And, you know, because of the plan of God, they could not even wait for seven days to, to pass before they carry out their wicked plans. Now, it tells us in verse 7, now when Yeshua was in Bethany, in the house of Simon the leper. Now when we look in the text, you will see that Yeshua was in Jerusalem for a while. Right? Maybe two or three weeks he was in Jerusalem. And because he went up to Jerusalem early, we saw when he went into the temple, he cleansed the temple and stuff like that. You know, and, and we saw when he performed, when he uh, went up to the fig tree, he was expecting to meet uh, fruit on the fig tree, and there was no fruit on the fig tree, and he caused the fig tree. So we see all of that. So he was in Jerusalem maybe two or three weeks. So what the, what the writer of the text is doing here in verse 6, he's taking us back. The writer of the text is taking us back to something that happened maybe a week before. So in verse 6 he said, now when Yeshua was in Bethany, in the house of Simon the leper. Now this guy Simon the leper, he is this person who had leprosy. And it seems as it could have been that he was a well-to-do person. So when you read other parts of the, 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 the gospel, you will see it seems like what this text probably might be referring to, although all of the information is not here. There's a possibility because of Yeshua healed this guy Simon the leper and also raised Lazarus from the dead. There's a possibility that they were having a celebration or an appreciation uh, party for Yeshua the Messiah at the house of this man, Simon the leper. Mind you, he was already cleansed but because he had leprosy, I guess he had leprosy for so long, you know, they're still calling him Simon the leper, but, you know, his leprosy was already cleansed. Now when Yeshua was in uh, Bethany, in the house of Simon the leper, so uh, there's a possibility that Lazarus was there, Mary and Martha, and all of those people was there, and the 12 disciples was there, all of these people gathered together in the house of Simon to have this um, appreciation uh, party for Yeshua. Uh, I guess in regards to him raising Lazarus from the dead and healing Simon from leprosy. It tells us in verse 7, There came to him a woman having an alabaster box, a very precious ointment, and poured it on his head as he sat at dinner. Now, the woman in this text is unknown, but in Christian Soto, some uh, interpreters is labeling this woman here as a prostitute. When you're reading the book of John, John said that the woman in this text is Mary, uh, the sister of Lazarus. So that there's different ways that people try to interpret who this woman really was. But in the book of Matthew here, Matthew never interpret uh, or give us uh, any explanation in regards to who this woman is. She is, I, uh, she is unidentified. There came to him a woman having an alabaster box. And I believe that there's a possibility maybe this woman was not invited. And she probably just, you know, maybe know about this party that was going on, this celebration that was happening, and she just suddenly came in. She came in because maybe God impressed on her heart that the Messiah was uh, two days away from dying and she had a job to be performed on 
the life of, of uh, on the body of Yeshua the Messiah. So there came uh, in verse seven. There came to him a woman having an alabaster box of very precious ointment. When we talk here about an alabaster box, this is talking about it's a it's a bottle that they used to put perfume in. They call that expensive perfume back in the day, spikenard, and this was very expensive. And when we go into other parts of the gospel, we will see that when uh, uh, this uh, uh, is being referred to, uh, it says that the, 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 the perfume that this woman had, it, it valued um, a one year uh, work from a laborer. It valued a laborer's wages for one year, for 300 days, 300 days work. This uh, box of perfume, it valued 300 days work. So approximately a year uh, work from a laborer, this box of perfume, alabaster box that this woman had, valued that amount. And it tells us that poured it on his head as he sat at dinner. So there's a possibility she came up behind him. Maybe Yeshua didn't expect it. I don't think he knew that she was going to do that. He didn't ask for that, but she came up behind him and she just opened the bottle and poured all of that uh, ointment on him. And as I said before, this is very expensive stuff that she's using there. And you know, some interpreters believe that this probably was uh, the dowry that this person, this unknown woman had. She probably was saving up this. Uh, spike now because spike now was very expensive and when people invest in spike now back in the day it, it was like if you have gold or you have cash you have silver or gold so this there's a possibility that this probably was the money that she was saving to pay for her marriage but here we see that even though this thing was so expensive and so precious to her and it said it was about a pound in other parts of the gospel, it said it was about a pound of uh, ointment that she had in this bottle. And she poured it on his head as he sat at dinner. Now, in, in John, the book of John, John said that she poured it on his feet and she took her hair and she started wiping uh, the, the, the feet with the hair, with her tears and all of that. But here, Matthew is saying that uh, he, he, the, the woman poured it on his head. So there's a possibility because this ointment was so much, it ran down from his head and it go down to, you know, other parts of his body. It probably go all over, you know, his body. So uh, John probably maybe have a point when he said that uh, she poured it on his feet. It could be from the head right down to the feet. Now it, it, it tells us in verse 7, but when his disciples saw it, they had indignation, saying, to what purpose is this waste? When the disciples saw it, the disciples was grieved. They were angry, they were upset. And they said, why, why did she do this? This is, this is a waste. They knew exactly how much this ointment cost. And when we read in other parts of the gospel, we will see it was Judas who came up with the calculation because he was the treasurer. Judas was good when money is concerned. And he said, well, this ointment could have been sold for 300 denarius, 300 days work. So, you know, um, uh, the disciples, not only Judas alone was upset. You know, you know, sometimes, you know, a lot of times we might have things on our mind that we want to say and sometimes people, uh, they don't want to talk, they don't want to come out up front and say what they have on their mind and they have uh, maybe have a person among us who who is uh, who like to speak their mind and they will come up and say exactly what they have on their mind. It seems as though the disciples have in their mind the same thought that Judas had but they, they, they was afraid to express it and Judas is the one that came up and said well this could have been sold for 300 denarius and all of them was Angry, they were, uh, they, you know, they, uh, uh, as the text said, they had indignation saying, To what purpose is this waste? 
And you know, when I look at the text, I, I, I'm asking myself the question, how did the disciples see Jesus? How did they see him? In our time today, in Christianity today, most people see Jesus as God. But when you look at what the text is telling us here, because of the fact that this woman take this expensive ointment and pour it on the head of Jesus, and these disciples are saying, why did she do that? It's a waste. She wastes all this amount of, uh, 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 of ointment by pouring it on the head of, of Yeshua the Messiah. How did they look at, the, uh, at Yeshua? How did they see him? Did the disciples saw Jesus as God? And if they saw him as God, why would they be angry knowing that this woman is pouring this precious ointment on God? And what I'm saying here, because of the fact that I'm seeing that this, the disciples are very angry at what the woman did, I don't believe that the disciples saw Yeshua the Messiah as God. I believe they saw him as their teacher. He, they, they saw him as a rabbi. But he was one of them. He was one of the boys. Yes, they respect him. You know, because they knew, they knew all of the different miracles that he was performing. As, you know, as Nicodemus said that, you know, no, no man can do these miracles except God be with him. They knew that God was with him. But to say that they consider him or see him as God, I don't think so. Because we have to understand that the doctrine that Jesus is God didn't come into effect until maybe 300 years, 350 years after the death, burial, and resurrection of Yeshua the Messiah. So what it tells us in verse 8, but when his disciples saw it, they had indignation saying, to what purpose is this waste? So what they say is that this is a waste. And my point is, if they, if they knew and they recognized Jesus as God, I can't see them saying that what was done here is a waste. The reason why they are saying this is because they saw Yeshua as a man, as an ordinary man. Yes, anointed by God, sent by God, God with him and all of that, but they did not see him as God because they can't see how they will see him as God and still use these words that they are using here. Now in verse, in verse 9, for this ointment might have been sold for much and given to the poor. What they're saying is that we could have found other things to do with this ointment. It could have been sold and given to the poor. And it, it tells us in verse 10, when Yeshua understood it. You know, when I read the Bible, I, I, I try to read slow. And when you read the Bible and you read slow, a lot of things that people jump in over, you're not going to miss it. And look at what the text said. Look at what the text uh, uh, in verse, um, verse 10. When Yeshua understood it, what does this mean? So if, if Yeshua, if, he, he understood it. That means he, he, he is not all knowledgeable. He, he, he is not omniscient. It means that Yeshua don't have that uh, you know, quality uh, that God the Father had where God all knowing. It means what the text is saying here, there was a point when Yeshua didn't understand, he didn't know what was going on. He didn't know what the disciples were saying or what the disciples was thinking. And this is not the first time we are coming across a um, little phrase that give us the indication that Yeshua was a human person. We saw, as I mentioned at the starting of this uh, talk, that when Yeshua was uh, in Bethany, he was going up uh, back to Jerusalem, and the text said he was hungry and he saw a fig tree afar off. And he was, you know, expecting to find fruit on the fig tree. And when he went up to the fig tree, there was no fruit. And what did he do? He caused the fig tree. Was he God when he went up to the fig tree and found out that there is no fruit on the fig tree when he was expecting fruit to be at the fig tree? No, he was a man. And also in the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 24 and 36, it tells us Yeshua himself said in regards to his coming, his second coming, he said not, oh, not even the holy angels, the angels of God in heaven knew when he was going to return. And in the book of Mark, Mark also mentioned not even the Son of God or the Son of Man 
knew when Yeshua the Messiah is going to be, uh, return. So we are seeing that there are certain things that Yeshua did not know. And, you know, I know theologians in the church, what they will say is that while he was in the flesh, when he was here, Lord, as a man, uh, he limited himself to certain things. But what I think the text is showing us is that Yeshua was a man. He was a man anointed by God. He was not God because there's only one God. Yeah, here on Israel, the Lord of God is one. There's one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Jesus is the go-between. He is the mediator. He is the lawyer. He is the one who is in a, a human form, who is touched by the feelings of our infirmity. That is the reason why the Bible said Yeshua is touched by the feelings of our infirmity. Why? Because he lived here on earth. He knew the things that we are experiencing. Some of the things that we are going through, some of the suffering that we are facing, some of the oppressive situation that we are facing in our life. Yeshua, when he was here on earth, he experienced some of these things. And that's the reason why the Word of God is saying that he is touched by the feelings of our infirmity. Now, it tells us when Yeshua understood it, so the point I'm trying to make here is that there was a time when Yeshua didn't have all of the knowledge of what was taking place here. What this woman did to him. Somebody come along and explain it to him. He had the understanding. He said, he said to them, why trouble you the woman? So why are you provoking the woman? Why are you disturbing the woman? Why are you upset with this woman? I know what I'm seeing here. There are so many times in the gospel you will see Yeshua will come to the rescue of women. You remember the woman who was taken in adultery? This, these guys brought this woman to Yeshua and said she was taken in adultery in the very act. And there was no man, only the woman. And we saw where Yeshua came to the rescue of that woman. We saw also the, 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 the woman who had the issue of blood. The woman who had the issue of blood for that amount of years, Yeshua came to her rescue. You remember the Syrophoenician woman also, who had, whose daughter had this Ill, illness? Yeshua came to her rescue also. And when I look at the text of scripture, Yeshua loved women. We have to disregard a lot of these things that they're telling us in the church today about women. Women are supposed to preach in church and women are supposed to do this and all of this kind of thing. And we see where Yeshua, he gave uh, the woman of Samaria, gave her the message to go to her, to her um, village to preach. And you know, in, in, in a large chunk of Christianity, believe that women are supposed to be silent in church. But what we have to understand is that only Christian writers, when you do some studying and you will see that the only Christian writer, what writers did not have a, a, a high view of women. Most of the early Christian writers, and maybe some of the guys that write this Bible, they didn't have a high view of women. And a lot of these guys, they didn't even want to have a wife. You read and you see some of these guys, they will castrate themselves. Because they tell themselves, you know, if they are without a woman in their life, they're going to be closer to God. Because they knew that Yeshua the Messiah did not have a wife. And if they don't have a wife, that would make them closer to God. So a lot of them used to make themselves eunuch. They used to um, cut out their private parts because that would give them the opportunity whereby, you know, they, they would be able to get more closer to God. But when, when we look in, in the text here and we see how Yeshua is coming to the rescue of this woman, it says in, in verse, in, in verse uh, what verse is that? In verse 10, yes. When, thank you. When Yeshua understood it, he said to them, Why trouble you the woman? For she had worked a good work upon me. Now the text don't tell us this, but it seems that this woman has some kind of a information on the death of Yeshua. And that is the reason why she's doing that. Maybe God revealed it to, to, to her. And a lot of times, you know, um, we criticize women and we say, oh, you know, they're too quick to do this and they, you know, they're the first one who will jump up in church and roll on the ground and stuff like that. But I tell you, women are very spiritual. 
And most women are more spiritual than us men. Uh, women will pick up things that we don't pick up. And here we are seeing that this woman, somewhere on the line, she was able to know the text don't really say, but it seems as though God probably revealed to this woman that the, the, the Messiah was going to die and he, he needed this anointing upon his body for she had worked a good work upon me. Are we doing any good works for God? Are we making any sacrifice for God? Look at the sacrifice that this woman made here. This was 300 days work, a whole year work, uh, wages. She took that and she poured it on yeah, uh, Yeshua. She didn't even think about it, you know? And I guess, you know, how we can apply this to ourselves is that, brethren, when it comes to God, it, it ought not to be any limit, you know, when, when it comes to serving God, we ought not to put any limit. When it comes to doing things to God, we are not to put any limit on it because we have to know that, you know, uh, the, the scripture tells us that uh, whatever we sow, we are going to reap. The Lord is not unfaithful to forget our works, our labor of love that we have done towards his great name. And I know that this woman is going to be rewarded because we, we're going to see what Yeshua is going to say about her in the text here. Um, for it said in verse 11, for ye have the poor. So what they said is that this should be sold and given to the poor. But Yeshua is saying after he was updated, or after they gave him the full information of what was happening here. For you have the poor always with you, but me ye have not always. So what Yeshua is saying here, the poor is always going to be with us, even in our time. The poor, poor people is going to always be here. And you know, once we have greedy people in the world, once we have people who are greedy about money, greedy about wealth, do you know the more people get rich, is it more people to become poor? Look at what is going on in the world today with all of this uh, COVID going on for what, almost what, two and a half, three years, this COVID thing going on. You know when people lose their job? And during that time, you know how much people getting rich? You know, look at what is going on right here in Ontario. I think it's last week, the government pulled those grocery store owners in before uh, the House of Assembly to, to question them in regards to, you know, how um, food price is going up so high. Food price is climbing. And these grocery stores, they're making billions of dollars. Billions of dollars. And what is in that next year? that food prices are going up 7% more. And the, the government wants to know how come the grocery stores making so much money and the, the food price still going up. What they're telling us right now in Ontario, maybe throughout Canada, people have to make a choice between uh, paying their rent and buying their food. People are losing their homes and, and stuff like that. And these people are making money. Look at it was last week. All of the banks in Canada, they give out their report, how much profit they make, see much profit all of these banks are making. You, you check lately and see how much interest rate is going up. Do you know for this year alone, in Canada, they raise interest rate seven times. If you have money in the bank, your money is not going high enough. And even though you don't have a high risk investment, any money you have invest in the bank, it's going down. And the bank uh, investment, whatever the bank, whatever belongs to the bank, it's getting higher and higher. And you know, the, the poor, uh, according to what Yeshua is saying, we are always going to have poor people. And not only poor people, we are always going to have poor people, we are always going to have racism. Once this world go on, continue to go on, we are going to continue to have poor people, we are going to continue to have racism. These two things are not going to come to an end until when Yeshua the Messiah returned, when God the Father said, this is the day that Yeshua have to go back and straighten things out, then these things will come to an end. But once, you know, society go on, life go on, we're going to have poor people. Because once we have people who are greedy for money, the more uh, people become rich, is the more people are getting poor. 
And it, it, it tells us um, in verse uh, 12, verse 11, I, I did 11 already. For you, have, for you have the poor always with you, but me ye have not always. So what Yeshua is saying, yes, at, at the end of 11, he's not going to be around forever. Yeshua knew that he was going to die. But it doesn't mean because he knew he was going to die that that, that make him God. You know, it's all these things people are, are put away. You know all of this, so that means that he was God. You know, there are they, some human beings, for some reason, they know exactly that the time is coming. And some people know uh, this is going to be their last day. I remember um, my, my mother-in-law, she used to say, she, don't, she only wanted to live until, what was 91, she said, Doreen? 90. 90. <laughs> she said she wanted to live for, until she 90. And I think as soon as he passed 90, that was it. So it doesn't mean because Yeshua, he knew that he was going to die, that made him God. It's God the Father that revealed all of these things to him. So what he's saying, but me, you have not always. And there's a possibility that the disciples was taking Yeshua for granted. They didn't expect him to die because nobody expect the Messiah to die. In the, in the view of those people back in the fourth century, the Messiah is not supposed to die. The Messiah is supposed to come and he's supposed to establish his kingdom. And that was what these, uh, these disciples was expecting. So when Yeshua is talking about here that, you know, he's not going to be with them uh, always, they didn't see it that way. They were taking it for granted that he's going to be with them for a long period of time. And we have to be careful that we don't take our loved ones for granted. You know, sometimes we tell ourselves, you know, because somebody is str strong, they're healthy, running up and down, they're going to be here forever. They're not going to be here forever. You know, as we have people in our life, brethren, we have to treat them good. Treat them good while they are alive. Don't wait until they're dead. You know, don't wait until your mom back in the Caribbean passed away and you going down from Canada and you're buying the best casket. When she was down there or he was down there and can't get food to eat, now is the time give him the best. Treat him the best. Now it, it tells us in verse 12, for in that she had poured this ointment on my body, she did it for my burial. So this woman poured this expensive ointment on Yeshua's body. And what Yeshua is saying, she did it for his burial. This was not a man who doing it. It's a woman. A woman poured this precious ointment upon him. And he said that she did it for his burial. Now look at, look at what we have in the text here. here. He said in, the, in verse 12, For in that she had poured this ointment on my body. Did Yeshua have a body? Did Yeshua have a body? If he have a body, does God have a body? Remember one time Moses trying to be fresh and say, you know, he wanted to see God. Remember that? Moses said he wanted to see God. And I think, I find what the, the text, the, the Lord told him to stand on this rock, if I remember correctly. And the Lord passed by, but because the glory of God was so uh, strong, God had to put his hand over Moses' face to block the, the, the glory because he might have blind Moses, you know. I, 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 think, I, I think that was the time when Moses came down because the glory was so strong on him. He had also put on a blindfold because the people couldn't look at Moses because of the glory that was upon him. So, you know, when, when we look at what the text is telling us here, Yeshua had a body. If you have a body, it means that you're a human being. And look at what he said again. For in that she had poured this ointment on my body, on his body, he had a body. She did it for my burial. He had a burial. You know, I talked about that before. Can, can you crucify God? Can you bury God? Yeshua was a man when he was crucified. Where, where he is in God's kingdom right now. He is a man. He is in a, in a human body. According to what theologians are telling us because of what the text says. Uh, you know, flesh and blood can inherit the kingdom of God. A flesh and blood person can go into God's, God's kingdom. So what they're saying is that he had a flesh and bone body. 
But the thing is, where Yeshua is right now, he is in a body, he, he, is, he, he, he don't take on some kind of God form. The same way he was taken up, that is what the text tells us. He was taken up in the book of Acts, and the angel said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into the, the sky? This same Jesus that was taken up is going to re return in like manner. So it means when, when he assured, when the time comes for him to return, he's going to return in a body. And we'll be able to see him. He's coming back in a body. Bless the Lord. They did that for his burial. He knew that he was going to die. And he said that this woman anointed him for his burial. You know, it's amazing that all of these men that Yeshua had around him, none of them didn't sense that. None of these guys who think that they were right hand man to Yeshua, the one that Jesus loved. Nobody came up with that. Nobody even um, had the slightest idea that Yeshua was going to die and he needs to be anointed. But this woman who was not considered, you know, she, she somehow she had this within her. This was within her spirit. Uh, you could imagine the trouble that she went through to get into that place to pour this oil upon Yeshua, but she did. She made the sacrifice. In verse 13, truly I say to you, wherever this gospel shall be preached in the whole world, there shall also this that this woman had done be told for a memorial. So what Yeshua is saying here, anyway the gospel is preached, because of what this woman did, uh, she is going to be held in memorial. We, we have to remember her. This is something that she did, and we have to keep it in, in memory. You can't leave this out when you're preaching the text, when you come across that. In verse 14, Then one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest. Now, in verse 14, he said, uh, one of the twelve, Judas was one of the twelve. Judas, there's a possibility that Judas was one of Jesus' closest friends. Ju Judas wasn't an enemy. He was very close. Why would Yeshua take somebody that is his enemy to make him a treasurer? He was very close to Yeshua. But even though he was close, you know, he took the opportunity to um, betray him. Then one of the twelve called Judas Iscariot. When the text calls him Iscariot, there is nobody else in the Bible who have that name attached to them. That is a title to identify what Judas did to Yeshua the Messiah. He went to the chief priest. You see who he went to? He went to the chief priest. He went to Annas. He knew, he, he knew the hatred that Annas had for Yeshua the Messiah. And Annas is a crook. He likes to, 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 to scheme, deal, make deals. So here we see that um, Judas, he went directly to the chief priest and said to them, what will you give me? And I will deliver him to you. What will you give me? He wants to know what, he's, what is he going to get out of it. What is he going to get out of it? Make me an offer and I'm going to give him to you. And they covenanted with him for 30 pieces of silver. You know, what Judah, Judas did, Judas betrayed Christ by identifying him with a kiss. And the, 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 the question that we have to ask is whether or not the disciples and Jesus, did they look alike? Or why? How come they couldn't identify who Jesus was? Jesus was a miracle worker. He went in the temple in Jerusalem. He overturned the tables of the money changers and he drive all of these people out of the temple. But according to what the text is saying here, um, Judas had to go and identify him. So there's a possibility that all of the boys probably look, they probably look, look alike. You know, I, just like, you know, a lot of times uh, people find it difficult, find it hard to, to identify uh, black people. And I want to know if that maybe play into to all of that. Maybe the reason why they couldn't identify him. The Romans, you know, they couldn't identify who Yeshua was. So uh, Judas had to go and give him a kiss. And that is how they identify him. And the, 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 the text tells us, they, 
and they covenanted with him for 30 pieces of silver. So there's a possibility that they did not pay him up front. They make a covenant with him. They say, listen, we, 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 we make a deal with you. We're going to give you 30 pieces of silver. And when you're talking about the 30 pieces of silver, 30 pieces of silver is the price of a slave. Back in the day, when you have a slave working on your uh, plantation, and one of your animal, one of your bull, um, you know, boot one of your, your slave and he died, that was the price that was paid for a slave that was killed by an animal. So what is happening here is that Yeshua, uh, Judas, the high priest, paid 30 pieces of silver to Judas for betraying Yeshua the Messiah. And this is the price of a slave. They did not put a high price on Yeshua the Messiah. In other words, like they undervalue him. He wasn't a slave. But still, they um, gave the price of a slave for him. They covenanted with him for 30 pieces of silver. And as we close, and from that time, he sought opportunity to betray him. From that time, he sought opportunity to betray him. We don't know exactly why Judas betrayed Christ. You know, people are coming up with all kinds of suggestions. You know, some people think maybe he probably was angry because he figured that uh, Yeshua was not moving fast enough. Yeshua didn't meet his expectation. He probably was angry because of what Yeshua said to, uh, to him, you know, in regards to the woman, because the woman poured all of this ointment on Yeshua, and he's the one that came up with the idea that, you know, the ointment should have been sold for, for, for 300 uh, denaries. There's a possibility he probably upset, but we don't know exactly uh, what caused it. But somewhere along the line, there's a possibility that Judas had a relationship. He had a relationship with Yeshua. He was in a relationship with Yeshua. But somewhere along the line, as the, the word of God tells us, the, the scripture tells us, he allows Satan to get into him. And, you know, as I look at the text here that Yeshua is going to... Um, he made this covenant and he's looking for opportunity whereby that he can betray Yeshua, Yeshua the Messiah. Brethren, that can happen to any one of us, you know. This is not just confined to Yeshua. Any one of us, brethren, we can be in a relationship with God and we allow the devil to get into our life. We, 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 are, not, we are not exempt from this. Any one of us can allow the devil to get into our life. And just like what we are seeing here, Yeshua looking for an opportunity to betray, in other words, to, 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 to give up his faith. Brethren, we are not to look for an opportunity to give up our faith. This is the last time that we are living in, brethren. And this is the time that we have to hang on to our faith. You know, um, the word tells us, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to pay every man according to his work. Brethren, do throw away your faith. Cast not away therefore your confidence, which have great recompense of reward. For, we, for you have need of patience, that when you have preached the gospel, um, uh, I can't forget that, that, that part of the text. But don't throw away your, your, your faith. Don't uh, throw away your faith. Brethren, this is the time for us to hold on to our faith because we know that the time will come when the Lord is going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. Uh, enter into the joy of the Lord. And this is what we are hoping to receive, brethren, as we persevere on to the end. The Lord bless us. I'm going to ask the, um, well, we don't have any musician today. I'm going to ask the singers to come back. And we will sing.